Hello, welcome back. Today I'm going to be exploring a wonderful, a mysterious and extremely secretive, probably one of the most secretive buildings on earth. This video is by the B1M and this video is how Britain built its top secret MI6 headquarters. How does one do that? How does one build such a secretive, massive building for MI6 in the middle of London? And I do remember this was one of the places that I did want to see when I was in London. And the only time that I did see it, I was on the water taxi, which by the way, uh, at least as a tourist, I absolutely loved. We were on that multiple times. You see so many sites and so many places that you're like, oh wow, I want to go there. But this was one of the buildings, got a couple pictures of it, and that's about it from the river. So let's just jump into this and let's figure out how did they do this, how they built MI6. I am torn between who my favorite Bond is, between Sean Connery and Roger Moore. Please feel free to say who your favorite Bond is or even which film. With that random side note, let's get started. How do you keep a building secret? Maybe you find an undercover location hidden away from prying eyes. Right. Or do you design something that blends in? The kind of place you might walk past without thinking twice. And who do you keep that building a secret from? Can you even keep it a secret from the people who built it? And can you really keep anything under wraps when it's the home of this guy? The name's Bond. James Bond. Excellent. Skyfall, excellent. The building behind me is not just the London office of the world's most famous secret agents. It's also the real life headquarters of SIS, Britain's secret intelligence service, mm. better known to the rest of the world by its nickname, MI6. The building is a secure yes. cutting edge fortress, but its predecessors have often been the exact opposite. And the story of how the service ended up here says a lot about how it's evolved. This is how Britain built its spy headquarters. Yes. Love it. And their bond and drill. Vauxhall Cross, to give the building its proper name, is a monumental edifice of espionage. Its imposing imperial design is kind of the modern face of the iconic service. But it's actually come a really long way from SIS's more humble origins. Before Vauxhall Cross, SIS stayed true to its motto of always secret by simply hiding in plain sight. In 1909, according to the brass plaque on the exterior, this building was the office of Messrs Raisin Falcon Limited Shippers and Exporters. Only a select few were aware it was actually the headquarters of SIS founder Sir Mansfield Cumming. Cumming was a workaholic with a long legacy. He signed his name C and wrote exclusively in green ink, a tradition which continues for the head of the service to this day. He was also obsessive about secrecy. In 1919, when he moved his office to this townhouse in West London, Visitors were first instructed to go to an office six kilometers away on the Strand, where they were then given the address. He even tried to keep the location from his boss, the Director of Military Intelligence. SAS continued the practice of renting commercial office space under a false name for the next few decades. But as the Cold War dawned, the limitations of that approach quickly became apparent. In 1964, the service was preparing to move out of this building in the exclusive St James area of West London, where it had been posing as the Minimax Fire Extinguisher Company. Much to the horror of the service, the current landlord started showing around prospective tenants before they'd moved out. I feel like I would not, if I was a landlord, I would not want to be showing the property to potential future tenants of this building of one of the most secretive agencies in the world. But they probably just had no idea anyways. So they probably just thought, okay, our tenants are moving out. Of course, it's going to be secret from them, I, I would assume and you just start showing it around. And that is really, really bad. I'm surprised that the government just didn't own the building that they were in, but maybe that was not secretive enough. On one day, a so-called Russian trade delegation came through, prompting frantic covering up of maps and other material. Oh, wow. Later that year, the service moved south of the Thames and rented the newly built Century House. 
This is how the building appeared then but in 2001 it was refurbished and turned into residential flats. Hmm. The new HQ wasn't much better. At a time when the existence of the service was still officially denied by the British government, the occupants of Century House were widely known. The Daily Telegraph even quipped that it was London's worst kept secret, known to every taxi driver, tourist guide and KGB agent. But it wasn't just the building's identity that was an issue. It had large glass windows that were perfect for snooping, and a petrol station at its base, making it the perfect target for an attack. Yeah, no, Now, before we go any good. further, if you want to be a top secret super spy, you'll need a good grasp of problem solving, and you're more likely to pick up a pencil than an exploding pen. Luckily, there's a fun and easy way to- Love Goldeneye, that is what I grew up on. When I was young, Goldeneye is, uh, is one of my favorites because I grew up on it. Each of these headquarters reflected a different part of the service's history. The clandestine offices of the embryonic service. The exclusive Broadway house that housed the service's Oxbridge graduates and minor aristocrats through World War II and the 1950s. And Century House, the dysfunctional HQ of a ramshackled organization riddled with double agents, best summed up in John le Carre's Carla Trilogy. By the 1980s, the building had become completely compromised. A 1985 report labelled Century House irredeemably insecure, and the hunt began for replacements. But where to go next? As the service looked for new premises, most options were ruled out because of the need to share the space with shops, restaurants or private accommodation. Any location outside London was ruled out because of the distance from other government agencies. Then, out of the blue, a solution was put forward. In 1987, Regalian Properties PLC approached the government, offering them the chance to acquire a proposed development on the south bank of the Thames. The government quickly agreed, but the intended occupants were kept top secret. I had no idea I was building MI6. I was told it was at government headquarters, and we guessed wrongly, <laughs> very early on, that it was for the Department of the Environment. The That's building was finished awesome. and handed over, and I was watching television, and on the screen, the British have announced that this is the headquarters of MI6. But how do you keep a massive new spy headquarters secret from the people who are actually building it? Well, a National Audit Office report published back in 2000 shed some light on this. To avoid any future embarrassment with a landlord, the decision was quickly taken to buy the building outright for a price of £135 million. Ooh. But even this nearly let the cat out of the bag. Government-funded projects are usually paid in instalments throughout construction, with each payment offering a chance for public scrutiny. Instead, mm. the Treasury arranged for the payment to be made in full before construction started. The that is a little suspicious if someone is very much looking into that and it's, it's not done the usual way. Plus, the building itself just looks... It looks like an MI6. It looks like it would be a very secretive building. Looks fantastic. The building definitely fits uh, its occupants. Property developer Regalian would then design and construct the building to a standard office specification with the addition of some specialist equipment, such as emergency generators and a document lift. This was, remember, still the 1980s. Once the main construction phase was completed, a further £10 million was spent fitting out the building to required standards. The same project managers and construction teams were kept on to complete this, with SIS itself then coming in to complete the most secret tasks mm -hmm. ahead of the building's opening in 1994. So, the question you've all been waiting for, what do you actually get in a top secret headquarters? Well, as you might expect, most of that is actually top secret, but here's what we do know. The building itself is a fortress. 25 different types of glass were used to meet the specific needs of this structure. Its triple glazed windows and stone exterior is bomb and bulletproof. Extra thick doors were specially designed to make the perimeter as secure as possible. Inside the complex, there's rumored to be a shooting range, ultra secure areas where eavesdropping is impossible, and a Faraday cage which blocks incoming radio waves. In a Financial Times interview, a spy said how employees are instructed to turn off all mobile phones long before they get in the building. I'd hope so. In other words, pretty secure. But there's just one more thing. Isn't that supposed to be a secret? 
I'm curious about this answer. If I were to guess, they just realized that keeping something this massive, it has to be a pretty big place, and the previous places have failed to remain secret. Maybe they just realized, well, here it is. Very much like the Pentagon here in the US. Just build it. Everyone's gonna know where it is, but it's just going to be extremely secretive within the walls of the actual building. And I don't know about you, but I think the building looks really, really awesome. It, it looks really good. <laughs> Great location too. If hidden payments and minimal subcontractors were this triumph of clandestine bureaucracy, then failure lay in hiring one of Britain's most famous architects to design a massive building right on the River Thames. Well, by this point, change yeah. had become inevitable. As the Cold War ended and the service continued to evolve, the construction of the new headquarters was seen as an opportunity to create a new, more public face for the service. Mm. Prime Minister John Major pledged to sweep away the cobwebs of secrecy surrounding Britain's spy services. When the new headquarters was completed, it was named SISHQ, but that was actually the first time the British government had ever officially even acknowledged the existence of SIS. Ultimately, we'll never know what really goes on over there in Vauxhall Cross. But what this story shows us is the power of a building to shape the organisation within it. And that was the video. It's getting dark here. Sorry, I need to turn on the lights, but uh, it kind of works for this video. Very secretive. So let me know anything really about MI6. I love the building. It's one of the craziest looking buildings in a, in a very good way that I have ever seen. I wonder if people even know how many employees are employed by MI6. But anything else that you could shed light on on this building about history, SIS, or MI6 in general, Please let me know. It's very fascinating to me. I absolutely love this kind of stuff. Tell me who your favorite Bond is, what Bond film you like, and so on. So thank you for watching and have a good rest of your day.